what this is right here. You know what that is? This is our worship guide. Sometimes we call that a worship folder, our bulletin. We print one of these every Sunday. And the reason we do that is because inside here, it tells everybody what is going to come next in the service. And if they've got a part, it tells them what to say or what to sing. So it's, it's pretty useful. At the same time, I sometimes wonder, I have to confess, why we print one of these every Sunday. Because every communion Sunday, we do the same things. And every non-communion Sunday, we also do the same things. And most of us here pretty much know what's coming and, and you know, we know what's going on. I sometimes think that I could just about do this myself with my eyes closed. And from where I sit up here on some Sunday mornings, I'm convinced that some of you know that you can do it with your eyes closed. Because I see you with your eyes closed. Just saying. Okay. Now don't get me wrong, it's not bad to have a worship guide like this. A worship plan like this. Unless unless the plan itself somehow becomes more important than, than our worship. Because, kids, you know why we come to worship? Who can tell me why we come to worship? What do we do here? We hear God's word, we sing God's praise, we worship God. I once heard about a church where the pastor got into a boatload of trouble because he changed the place in the service when they took the offering. <gasps> We've never done it that way before. And everybody got in a big tizzy about this. And there was great discussions and meetings and uproar. And you know how it is. You see, some people get overly concerned with the when and the how of worship. And they lose sight of the why of worship. And this is nothing new. Because this is something, kids, that Jesus ran into himself. One day he was out, he was teaching people, and his disciples were there. And, uh, and there were some religious leaders there that day, too, kind of checking up on Jesus. And it got to be lunchtime. And it, it was the tradition, of the re a religious tradition of the people there, that people wash their hands before meals. Do you kids wash your hands before your meals? Does your mom make you wash your hands? Before you eat? Okay. I got no comment. But most moms make, make us wash our hands before we eat. I know my mom always did that. And we have reasons for that. But, but back in Jesus' day, this was not just to clean our, their hands. It was a religious thing. It was something they did all the time, every single time. And you were kind of breaking a religious rule if you didn't do it. Well, anyway, that day, for whatever reason, Jesus' disciples did not wash their hands and these religious leaders, they got, all, they got all bent out of shape about this. They were upset about this. And so, um, and so they, the, the religious leaders questioned Jesus. They gave him a bad time. Well, Jesus, Jesus had a, an answer for these religious leaders. He said that... A clean heart was more important than clean hands. In other words, that we need, to, we need to be truly devoted to Jesus in our hearts and not pay so much attention to things on the outside. He's not saying that it's not important to wash our hands. He's saying that it's important to keep the commandments of God, and that's more important than just keeping our traditions. I hope we never become more concerned with the when and the how of things, of how we do things in church, than about the why we do them. Would you pray with me, please? Yes. Kids, let's pray. Would you fold your hands and repeat after me? Dear Father, can you say those words? Dear Father, help us to remember that we are in this place to worship you and that we worship you best when our worship comes from our hearts. Amen. Okay, thanks. Go back to your seats.
The first lesson is from the book of Deuteronomy. The word Deuteronomy literally means second law. And Deuteronomy consists chiefly of some speeches that Moses gave to the Israelites just prior to their entering the promised land. They'd been out in the desert for a long time. Now they were about to enter Canaan, the land they had been promised. But before they did, Moses wanted to remind them of a few things. He wanted to remind them of the fact that they had a loving God who had watched over them, and also the fact that they were to be obedient to him. We read from chapter 4, beginning at the first verse. Now, Israel, hear the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them, so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations, who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them, the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. The second lesson is from the epistle of James. The letter of James was intended to provide first century Christians with an instruction in godly behavior. Here they are encouraged to listen carefully and to act on what they hear, especially by caring for those least able to care for themselves. This is from chapter 1, beginning at verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is the word of the Lord. chapter. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding the tradition of the elders. 
When they come to the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why do your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for your mother or your father. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition you have handed, that you have handed down, and you do many other things like that. Here ends the reading of the lesson. Please be seated. And let us all pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you would come into our hearts and that you would find all those places of our hearts that are in so in need of you, and that you would wash them clean, that you would make them whole. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the risen Christ. Amen. I'm going to have you lay open your hymn books again to uh, the hymn of the day. We'll probably sing a couple verses somewhere in the middle. And I need to come down here for just a minute. Don't have a microphone, but that's okay. I'm just going to be down here for a second. Uh, I'm going to have Mark show you a couple of uh, pictures. Uh, they're both pictures of exactly the same thing, uh, but they're also very different. Uh, and you'll, you'll recognize a very familiar picture. Okay, there's the first one. You know her. I'd like to talk about the lesson today that we just heard. It's a story about lots of different things, but mainly it's a story about how you live your life and what you do and how you do those things and with whom you associate. It's also a story that asks the question, are you common? Are you just like everyone else? Or are you holy? That is, are you set apart, special, set apart for some purpose greater than just living for yourself? And of course, for the religious people of Jesus' day, and this would have included Jesus as well, the answer to that question is yes. I am special and I have been set apart for a purpose greater than myself. And of course, back then, the way they demonstrated that being set apart was acted out in something called the cleanliness laws. Following those laws meant that there were certain foods you could eat and other foods you could not. And it meant that those foods had to be prepared in a certain way. It meant that pots, pans, hands, anything that either touched the food or anything that the food went into had to be properly cleaned. These cleanliness laws also meant that there were certain people with whom you could eat and others with whom you could not. And the religious people of that day, Jesus included, followed those laws to the letter. 
It was important to them that they remain clean, uncontaminated by the world around them. Because as they kept themselves clean, they believed that others would see that they were really set apart for a purpose larger than themselves, that they were God's chosen people. Now, I think that desire for cleanliness is a belief that one can insulate oneself from uncleanliness. And while you and I might be somewhat unfamiliar with all these first century uh, cleansing rituals, we know how this works. It starts with, you've been out in public, you better wash your hands because you've got germs to kill. And then very soon it takes on a much more serious edge. Don't watch that movie. Violent images will bring you to violence. Don't hang with these people. They're a bad influence. Don't listen to certain kinds of music. It's going to mess with your head. But you see, all of those things, they come from outside of ourselves. And I I think we have this idea that if we can protect ourselves, if we can keep from seeing or hearing or having contact with those external things, then we can also avoid the evils that come with the more unsavory portions of the world in which we live. It's a way of sheltering ourselves, keeping our basic innocence by doing all the right things and being in wholesome places and thus staying clean. And it's a very popular way of how we understand our world. It was popular in Jesus' time. It's popular now. And it's something to which Jesus says, ha doesn't work that way. It's not what's outside that kills. It's the stuff that's inside you that is so very deadly. See, Jesus knows that when it comes to human cleanliness, it's never as simple as just avoiding the world. Jesus knows that you can do all the right things and you can surround yourself with all the right people and you can shelter yourself from that which you know causes you harm, and you can do all these things till the cows come home, and you know he knows this. He knows you can put blinders on your eyes. You can put cotton in your ears. He knows that you can install all the parental controls on your television to protect yourself and your children from every kind of germ and virus out there, both viruses of the body and viruses of the soul. And it won't make a single bit of difference. Staying uncontaminated won't save you from contamination. Why? Because the root problem is not what's on the outside. Jesus says it's what's inside that makes you unclean. It's what's inside that corrupts you and wounds you and hurt you so very much. Maybe it's envy, wanting what someone else has. Maybe it's self-gratification of all kinds, or speaking poorly of your neighbor, or pride. Jesus says that these are always, always internal matters, matters of your heart. And of course, that begs the question, doesn't it? How can you, by washing your hands, or choosing the right friends, or changing the channel, how can you shield yourself from the real culprit, your own heart? The fact of the matter is, is that the only way you can fix a corrupt heart is to put that corruption to death, is to let it die on the cross with someone who gives his life for you. Do not live with your self-centeredness. Let it be crucified in self-giving love. Don't let those things fuel your resentment or kindle your anger or your hatred. Let them be extinguished in the care of Jesus, which brings peace to your soul. Don't let 
your desire for retribution, or your need to exclude others who don't fit in consume you, let all of this be put to an end with God's peace, a peace that comes from serving others. Self-giving, love, peace. This is what Jesus is. And he loves you so much that he dies for you so that you will no longer be a slave to that troubled and hurting heart that has for so long formed your center. He dies to put all of those corrupt things within you to death, to free you and change and transform you and make you into a new person. It's not what's on the outside that corrupts. It's what's inside that matters. And of course, not only does Jesus know this, but he calls you to him. Come, he says. I will give my life so that you can be free from all those things that plague you. Turn now to your hymn book and let's sing the first two verses. Okay, let's take a look at our paintings one more time. Mark, can you show them the first painting? Somebody raise your hand. Is it up there? Okay. Now, let's see the second painting. Is it up there? Okay, Mark, there's a third slide. Show them both paintings together, side by side. Uh, are they all up there, both side by side? If you're like me, you like the second one better than the first one. There's a reason for that. The first one is a paint-by-numbers kit. <laughs> and the artist did exactly what he was told to do. It's all laid out for him. If he was to use color number 17, he used color number 17. And he meticulously painted right up to the line, did a perfect job everything that the kit demands. Second painting, no lines, no numbers, no little jars of color. There are shadows, there's blurriness, there's shades of light and dark that conceal as much as they reveal. And that's why it's a masterpiece. One is painted by the numbers, the other is painted from the heart. And that's what draws us in and moves us in a way that clearly defined lines and perfect even colors could never do. And so it is with our lives. Remember at the beginning of the sermon, I said that this story is about how you and I live, about what we do and how we do it and with whom we associate? 
How we live is never painting by the numbers. It's not a matter of doing all the right things or saying all the right things or being with all the right people. And it's certainly not a matter of shielding ourselves from everything else in the world that is wrong. Anything that passes off is cleanliness. No. This is a matter of the heart. So that as we bring all those internal affairs here and give them to Jesus, he changes us. He changes everything. He changes even the way we ask and answer that question, what do I do? And makes us not a keeper of cleanliness, but someone who loves as we were first loved. So that whatever you do, and however you do it, all happens from a willing spirit and a self-giving heart and a peace that cannot be explained. It happens out of a deep desire to be for others what Jesus has been for you. So that your life is lived not by the numbers, but instead it becomes a living, breathing masterpiece, a work of art. Because you see, when you find that someone dies for you, you begin to give yourself for others. You find yourself loving people who are not lovable because you're not lovable and someone loves you. You find yourself forgiving those who have offended you, even if they never apologize and caring for those that the rest of the world neglects, that the rest of the world deems not important. And for that, we give God thanks and praise. Amen. you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.